We'll be picking up in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 after I go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we want to lift up some prayer requests to You. We want to lift up our entire prayer list, and You know all about those, but we've added a few this evening. I want to pray for our sister June and hope she would get a good report and that everything would be fine at the doctor's appointment this week. For Dana and the family there who will be traveling later this week, give them safety and good weather and enjoyable time together as family. That they would once again be able to just fellowship together as they're not able to do on a regular basis. I want to pray for our sister Bonnie. We know that things are really difficult for her right now with the dementia. and uh, She's a long way from us to be able to visit, but Lord, we know that you can comfort there. And we turn our attention now, Father, to your holy word. We'll be bringing a message tonight from 1 Corinthians and pray that your Holy Spirit will be pleased to enlighten that word for us and that we would see great truths tonight, as we always do. And pray that your Holy Spirit would open hearts, that we may the message may penetrate there. And we need our spiritual ears and eyes open that we can hear and see what you want for us. And I ask, Father, as I do so often, that you would allow us to put the things of the world aside for a few moments. I know there's so many things to think about, so many things that we may want to do, but help us to focus on you here for these next whatever minutes that I'll be speaking. And then take the message and your word with us when we leave tonight, that we may use it to reach the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for these who have come out tonight. And I pray that you would be with us to lead us in this hour. And we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All I could think about even when I was praying was when the Lord will come at him just now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, Elizabeth also asked for prayer for her sister Becky. Becky. She's in the hospital. I think she said Bradford. If you would add that. I can't remember Becky's last name, but if you I would. Don't remember her last name. It's Elizabeth's sister Becky, if you would add her to the prayer list. And Linda was able to visit uh, Grace and bring the car to her. All right. First Corinthians chapter 6, I'll be beginning in verse 1, and I'll be reading the first 11 verses dare any of you having a matter against another go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints do you not know that the saints will judge the world and if the world shall be judged by you are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters know ye not that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother, goeth to the, goeth the law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It's a new chapter. Same problems arising, more and more. It seems that with every stroke of the pen, there's a new problem that's being dealt with at the church in Corinth. It seems that there's, there's no end to it. 
This church had problem and we're not, and we haven't even scratched the surface yet. This time had to deal with the way the church dealt with certain problems and the way they were handling these problems affected the witness of the church. Now let me say that Paul had a full plate when it came to the problems of the church there at Corinth. And I'm amazed that he could cover so much ground in a relatively short letter like this. I'll tell you, if he had come, they would have to lock the doors because he would have probably preached for about two weeks straight. He had so much that he wanted to talk about and so much he wanted to correct. Anyway, we see that Paul was concerned with that two church members would have a disagreement and rather than settling it in the spirit of Christ, they would take each other to court. They would take it out there who may, these people who may not be believers, these people who may be wicked, they're taking the problem of the church out into the world. And later in this chapter, Paul was uh, concerned that there were some members in the church who saw no relationship between their faith in Jesus Christ and what they did in their bodies, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. If I do, we'll be here until after the holiday. But that's what you look for, the next problem that he's going to be dealing with. When I read this letter to the Corinthians, and I've read through it a number of times over the years, and I studied it in seminary and different things, and I read about all the issues which Paul was dealing with, I would hope it would be possible for us to get some insight into some of the issues that the church faces today, issues in which the witness of the church is at stake. Now, I understand that each and every one of us is the church. If you're a believer, you're, you're the church. But I'm talking about the church universal, the local church, the family. And we need to be quite aware of our witness to the community. It's so important, the witness of the church. Sadly, the issues which we face as a church family are increasingly difficult to sort out and they have devastating effects on the church family and its witness. You know, one person in the church can destroy the witness of the church. It just takes one. But let's say, for example, that some of the things that we're facing today that that church with all its problems didn't have to face. Let's look, there was a, a, a woman, that's our wife, and she has a very strong conviction about abortion. And she circulates petitions on the street and she urges the churches to stand up against abortion to pray about it, which is biblical. And then let's say her husband has to take a job at a place, for example, that makes nuclear weapons. And outside that facility, you'll have protesters talking about total disarmament and a worldwide ban on nuclear arms. Now in his mind, he may think that these people are communists. Well, you see, neither of these issues for the church today face those Christians in the time of Paul. We have a whole new set of rules. While that wife had a strong desire for the unborn child, her husband had that job of a government operated plant. Even if it broke his heart to cross those lines, he was doing, and you see the, the problems that we face. These are just some of the little things that, that can happen to us. And the church has to settle those issues inside and not in court. So Paul is actually telling the church at Corinth and he's speaking to us here today to do one thing. Settle your own differences. Keep them in house. You know, Paul had a long, I mean a long list of things he wanted to discuss with the Corinthian church. And I can plainly see that the list apparently was made up from reports that he'd received about what was going on in the church. You know, if Paul had gotten word of it, that everybody else had word of it too. And this is what was bothering him. Because the problems of that church, especially this one where they're taking them into court, had circulated. Now, you have to, when we think about the church then and the church today, don't think about them having a big facility, a nice building like we have. They would meet in houses or wherever they had an opportunity. But the family was still a church family. 
And there were still, in those days, just as it is today, the world is looking. They want to accuse. They're looking for anything that they can say against you to put down Jesus Christ. And that's what concerned Paul. You know, the amazing thing for us to remember about the witness of a church and the church or any individual believer and that anything that he does that's bad or, or does questionable things, it's going to travel quickly throughout the community. I mean, it's going to spread like wildfire. And by the time it gets from here to there, it's going to be increased in what actually didn't happen. Yeah. But if you do something good, if you do something wonderful, if you're serving Christ, it's going to be on page 43. It's a little byline in the back. You have to learn to accept that. But what's more important is not to give them the opportunity to throw an attack at you. The world's always looking for something that they can attack the church about or the individual believer. They want to attack. They, and I'm talking about the world, want to mock and they want to criticize. And that's what that church at Corinth was doing. They were giving the world an opportunity to criticize them. And when, they, when the church is criticized, you're criticizing Jesus Christ. It just happens. I've seen over the years where one member or two members of a church maybe get in trouble with some sexual problem. The whole church is judged. The whole ch churches have closed because of these things, because of the action of one person. The, the witness is just destroyed. And it's, you'll never regain it once that happens. You know, if you remember last week, I told you that Paul was shocked by how the Corinthian church had openly accepted fornication, all, that thing, all those things that were taking place in the church. Now he's shocked again. He's shocked by the fact that the Corinthians cannot handle these problems within the church. He's shocked that they want to take it out into the courts, out the, the dirt, air their dirty laundry in public. He's shocked about this. And every time I read these verses, I'm reminded of church squabbles that have spilled over into the courts and into the papers. And I've wondered how Paul wrote to the Corinthian church might be applied to us today. One church member who was an active member sued the church, and this is a true story, happened not too many years ago, being at a bit because he was not allowed to vote at a business meeting because he was not an active member of the church. And been at church for two years, but yet he wanted to vote at the business meeting. Church constitution made it clear he was not an active member, but he sued and took it to court where all he needed to do was sit down with his brothers and sisters and they could show him, well, you can't do that because this is the way it's written. In recent years, I've seen a, a church that had been growing and ministering in a very effective way become the object of ridicule because of a disgruntled group within the church that went to court to force the pastor and the lay leaders to make public certain financial records. I remember a church that got involved, this has been many years ago, with land speculation and taking uh, money from the congregation, people investing, hoping to get rich, and things fell apart and ended up in court. Well, first of all, the church shouldn't be in business. But secondly, the sin, it should not be in court. It shouldn't be airing our dirty laundry that way. These are the things which could and should have been taken care of within the church family. I watched as one of the greatest churches of our time almost destroyed itself in a long, expensive, bitter court battle between factions over the church property. Little things that should not ever come to that point. This happens, like I said, especially when the church goes into business. The church's business is the business of Jesus Christ to witness to the world, to take the gospel out there. The mission of the church is missions, not making money. These things should never, ever happen. And there's differences in, in both the churches and society of Paul's day and, and ours. But we find some guiding principles in his message to the Corinthians that will help us. Paul felt that Christians ought to be able to settle their own problems without the public display in secular courts. And that's true. 
It should happen that way. All that amounts to, as I said before, is the old adage, you're going to just air your dirty laundry in public. So Paul's conclusion was strengthened by his Jewish background and his concern for the church. Wow, did, did he say Jewish background? Yes. Because you're never going to understand the old until, uh, the new until you understand the old. And there's some things that we may not pick up on right away. Now, if we go to the history of the relationship between Israel, or Judea, and Rome, you'll find out that the Jews secure, secure permission from Rome to apply their own laws to themselves. In other words, they were going to judge themselves. They did not have a death penalty, but they could still uphold their own laws. For this reason, a faithful Jew would never consider ever taking any kind of Jewish problem to a Roman court. They were going to settle their problems within themselves. They were not going to air their dirty laundry. They're not going to say, well, this fellow and that fellow, they just can't get things together. They were going to answer it by the Mosaic law, by what God says. In other words, it was kept in the family, so to speak. See, this is, the, this is what Paul has in mind too. The Holy Spirit is, in, of course, inspiring him to write, but it's the background that has been established for him that he understood. And that if there were Jewish believers in the church there, they understood this. You know, they were those that uh, even had a procedure for setting up and dealing with differences within the Jewish community, those uh, personal differences, everything stayed in community. Everything stayed within the Jewish community. That was Paul's background. And more importantly, it was the background of any Jewish member that was in that Corinthian church. So the Jewish believers there would have understood much quicker than the Greek members. So the Greek members, when I use Greek, of course we're talking about the Gentiles, but the Greek influence of the world is there. You know, the Greek members of the church had a different heritage. And so therefore they had a different view on this matter. They weren't brought up in the Jewish community. Even though they're part of the Roman Empire, they was different. And there were among the Greeks a natural love of litigation. If you go back and look at Greek culture, they had a fondness for the contest, for debate, for oratory, and it made going to court a form of entertainment. For them, it was like people today might want to go to the movies. This is something we enjoy. And so they would like to take their problems to court because they enjoyed all the arguing and everything that went along with it. And some people just love to argue. Have you ever met people who love to argue? They're out there. If you say the sky is blue, they're going to argue with you. They just love to argue. They enjoy it. They don't seem happy unless there's something for them to fuss and argue about. Well, there were some in the Greek system uh, that there was a method of, of settling disputes before they got to court. That's a fact. Evidently, these particular church members were not availing themselves of the quieter way of solving their problems. Many times, if not most times, the problem of going to a secular court was one of pride. I want to be right. I want as many people as possible to know that I'm right, so I'm going to take it out to the public. Pride will cause problems. Even in a small church matter that the church can discuss, if somebody is full of pride and they think they're right, they're going to take it out. They're going to start, may not take it to court. They're going to tell their neighbor and the neighbor's going to tell their neighbor and they're going to stand in line. No. I, want, I want to be right. I want everybody to know I'm right. Doesn't that sound familiar? Uh, that amounts to my good over your good, my good over God's good. I'm more important than you are. That's all it amounts to. And I don't care if it hurts you or not. That's the wrong attitude. You know, from this morning, we need love may abound more and more. This is not abounding that way. That's going the opposite direction. We also need to understand not only was Paul's background different, but he approached problems from a, a different perspective than most other people. Church members then, like so many church members today, 
were completely absorbed in their own private concerns while Paul made his decisions, his recommendations from a position of maturity, Christian maturity, and because he was anxious for the church. Why was Paul anxious for the church? Because the church and Jesus Christ are one. And he was anxious not to cause any stain on the Savior. He wanted to keep things on the straight and narrow. He wanted it to keep their mind all the time in their mind, we are to serve Christ. And what am I doing? Am I doing something for His honor and glory or am I damaging it? You know, first Paul was concerned and rightly so about the need to grow spiritually. The Corinthians, as we do, needed a heart for Christ. If you have a heart for Christ, you're going to put Him first. You know, we were talking a little bit out front. We were talking about the spoked wheels on the old car. And I remember, you know, when, when you had a spoke wheel on a motorcycle and you had to lace that wheel, if you didn't get those spokes just right, it went ka-thump, ka-thump, ka-thump. If Jesus Christ is not first in your heart, if you don't put Him first, your life goes ka-thump, ka-thump, ka-thump. If He's not first, you're in trouble. And the church in Corinth was in trouble. Paul witnessed the fact that they were not able to settle the problems within the church without resorting to the secular court. And that was clear evidence of their failure of Christian leadership and Christian discipline. This means that the spiritual growth of the church family was non-existent. No, no spiritual growth. And if there was no spiritual growth, there was no leadership from those in charge, the pastor, the elders, the deacons, whoever. No leadership. No leadership is the same as taking someone in the wrong direction. A bit later in this letter, Paul is going to write about the importance of discovering and, and developing the spiritual gifts and learning to love each other. But at this point, Paul could not help but see the divisive spirit that there in the church. He's seen sexual immorality and the disputes in the court as obstacles to spiritual growth because people were thinking too much about what they wanted, too much involved in sin to think about what the Lord wants. When you take your mind off the Savior, where are you going to put it? You're going to put it in the world. And that was the problem. They were attempting to turn to the unbelieving secular court's rather than turn the problems over to the Lord and His guidance. They were for to the individual in the world. That's where they went. Let's not go that way. Let's not go to the world and get the world involved in any problems we have. We can go to the Lord and we can solve our problems in-house. Secondly, we see that Paul was concerned about the reputation of the Christians in Corinth and their witness to the lost people who are outside the church. He knew the least esteemed in which the Corinthians and the church were held by the pagan society. They were held in the least possible esteem. And every time they did something like this, taking the problems to court, the fornication that was going on, the esteem, that, what little esteem was out there for, was going down. Every day. What's going on? People had little regard for Christ. People, just like today, people say, well, if that's a Christian, huh, I have no need of it. You know, I've said before, if you're not witnessing for Christ, you're witnessing for the devil. Isn't that a terrible thing for a Christian to be doing? Witnessing for the devil. But it happens all the time. The lost world has no respect for, the, for that church and Paul knew full well that uh, the believer, soon believer, would only confirm the worst suspicions of the lost world out there. And the world today still has no respect for the church. Did you know that? We are still held in low esteem by the world. The unbelievers look at the church members as being no different from those of the lost world. That is a problem. It's a terrible condition to find yourself as a believer to look just like the world. 
And that's what happened to the Corinthian church. And that's what happens to churches today. That's what happens to individual believers today. If the lost would not see any difference in the Christians, what's going to draw them to Christ? All your words, as I've said, won't draw them. Your life will. How you live your life. And I want to tell you, this is a matter of continuing concern for the Christians today because there are always those on the outside, the church, the unbelievers, the world out there who seem to delight at every opportunity to discredit a Christian or a church and it brings disgrace on Jesus Christ. Christians today can get guidance from Paul's counsel. The Bible never gets old. It's a living book. The words are just as true today as when Paul penned them. And we need to be very careful not to push his point too far though and apply it to situations that are radically different. We have a tendency to do that. I don't think Paul was intending to suggest that justice was in, impossible in the secular courts for Christians or that Christians should never sue anyone. He's not saying that. What he's saying is we need to handle things in-house. Keep in mind that Paul is referring to Christians disagreeing with Christians. But Paul himself, when you think about it, he had received excellent treatments at the hands of Galeo, who was a deputy in Corinth. It was Galeo's fairness that wisdom and courage that saved Paul from the consequences of the Jewish insurrection there in Acts chapter 18. Oh, I know. God's hand intervened, but... He used this man in a secular court, a secular man to do that. You know, Paul also wrote in the letter to the Romans that the secular powers were what? Ordained of God and should be obeyed. That's something else that we don't always do. We don't always respect those God, whose God's put in command, put in leadership. No one's in leadership away from God's plan and purpose. It'd be helpful for those who try to transpose Paul's instruction to the Corinthians in this instance over and into a contemporary society. It needs to remember two things. First, there are many Christians who are part of our judicial system who bring a larger dimension to justice and, and truth and as a result, because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And secondly, Paul probably was not able to anticipate his uh, advice being applied to a highly complex industrial society such as ours today. I don't think Paul could imagine the situation that we have today. For example, there was a solid Bible-believing Christian man owned a chemical company and there was an explosion. And that explosion, several people were killed and injured and including some of his employees. And there was a question raised, how was this Christian man going to handle what was going to happen? His pastor said there was a, it was a time of great spiritual pain for this man. It was a loss because he was a person who prized his employees, cared about them, cared about their families. He took a real interest in their personal lives. He was known as a man who kept business and his religion separated. But knowing this, all these things about him, they wondered how he was going to deal with the avalanche of lawsuits and claims that everybody knew were going to come upon him. It's only a short time that following that accident, it was learned that he was part of a Christian organization who sought to get Christians to negotiate the legitimate settlements out of court. The organization had two reasons for doing this. First, to spend the money on the real victims rather than lawyers and court fees. Sounds smart to me. And second, to show that it's not necessary to take Christians to court in order, them, in order to get them to do what's right. Isn't that a simple and wonderful idea? And yet the world today would say, that's ridiculous. I can get more money if I go to court. Well, no, you may not get any more, but the lawyers will. While it's a very idealistic approach in our society, 
because our society is so complex. There's not a great deal of interest in that idea. But in many cases, it did work. And the case, of course, is still going on. Those cases go on for years. But if it should fail, it will not fail because he didn't try to do things the biblical way. Wouldn't it be nice if all Christians did things the biblical way? How many problems would be solved? You know, what Paul was working this at that time was a much simpler situation than that. He suggested that when two church members have a quarrel, it shouldn't end up in a lawsuit. Even if one of the, the brothers had suffered a wrong, it should not be in court. You should do it the biblical way. A Christian should take his responsibility, do what's right. And when kept in context, in the context of which it's written, boy, this is excellent advice. You know, verses 9 through 11 serve both as a conclusion for the uh, first part of the chapter and introduction to the verses that follows. So let me uh, read these verses again from nine, verses 9 through 11. These are important. I've, I've heard people misuse these verses on more than one occasion. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, or covetors, or drunkards, or revilers, or extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This reads like a roll call of the disinherited. When a will is read, people gather around the table and they wring their hands and they're waiting. And some people are always disinherited because they did something they shouldn't do. And then there's always the disappointment that follows, isn't it? You know, Paul didn't mean to leave that impression because believers, you're not going to be disinherited. I'm sure Paul's not saying that anyone who ever committed any of these sins, these particular sins, could not be a Christian. That's not what he's talking about. These lists of sins here, do you notice what he says? The unrighteous. There's your key word. These are the things that the sinners... Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom? He's talking about these unbelievers who continue to deceive, who continue to live in fornication, who enjoy these sins. These are the ones who are not going to inherit. These have been disinherited because they haven't come to Jesus Christ. I heard a fellow use this, these very sins to tell a woman that she was lost forever. She was a believer. She had eternal security. Now, if we were, uh, if that were the case, if all these things disqualified us from inheriting the kingdom, where would we be? We'd be on the outside looking in. There would be nobody, I mean nobody, going in the kingdom. That would be a very sad state. You'd have Jesus on the throne and nobody else with him. You know, Paul preached something different. He preached the gospel of deliverance and which those who repented of sin and turned to Jesus Christ were forgiven and made children of God. They were righteous, righteousness in Christ. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom. Don't skip any of the words when you're trying to interpret Scripture. It'll get you in trouble. I've heard people I say use these verses to condemn other people to hell. And that's utterly ridiculous. That comes back to a lack of spiritual maturity. It's an attitude of pride and arrogance. Well, I don't do those things. Yes, you do. What? Well, I don't. If you look through there and remember our standard is higher, have you ever thought about it? How many times have I mentioned it? Somebody cuts you off and you think, well, I wish you were dead. You just murdered that person. You look after somebody you lust, you just committed adultery. That standard is high for us. You know, Paul is speaking about unrepentant, unsaved sinners. But here Paul is actually giving the background of some of the members of that church, probably all of them. 
And such were some of you. He's being nice when he says, and such were some of you. That way everybody can say, well, he's talking about the person sitting next to me. He's talking to you and he's talking to me. It still hits pretty close to home, doesn't it? That's one thing about Paul. That's one thing about the Bible. It does not mince words. It does not water it down. The Bible tells you from beginning that you're a sinner. Those words still echo through this building today. And such were some of you. And it echoes on and on. And they're wonderful words because it's past tense. That's what you used to be. But you are in the inheritance. Your name is written in the will. And it can't be changed. There's a seal on that. Nothing can change it. So after he listed at least some of the pagan sins, declaring that those who continue to make them their practice in their lives are not going to inherit the kingdom of God, Paul goes on to remind them of the experience which they had in Christ that had separated them from the pagan world. The key word here being separated from the pagan world. When they came to Jesus Christ, you're separated. Paul did this to motivate them to take their calling seriously. We have to take it seriously. Each of us who are born again believers in Jesus Christ need to take our calling seriously and live in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord. You know, take a look at the three words that Paul uses to describe what happened to them and what happens to believers. He says they were washed, sanctified, justified. We were too, same thing. It's interesting that the verb Paul uses for washed, this Greek verb, is only used one other place in Scripture. It's in Acts 22, 16, and it's in connection with Paul's own conversion. And now, why tarrieth thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Wash, same word, wash away. The Corinthians had experienced this same cleansing. Brothers and sisters, we have experienced the same cleansing. We've been washed clean because we were filthy. Not on the outside, we were filthy on the inside. Paul was filthy on the inside. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they were all filthy on the inside. They all had to be washed. There had to be a cleaning that could be done that we could not do on our own. We couldn't reach. You're in the shower and you're trying to reach your back. Unless you have one of those aids to get that you can't reach it. Well, that's the way you are on the inside. You cannot reach the inside to get it clean. It takes the blood of Christ to wash you clean. There had to be a cleansing that takes place. We washed the outside, but the inside stayed dirty all those years. Oh, it's something that has to be accomplished by the Lord. We need help because we can't do it on our own. We can't reach that spot. And even if we could, we couldn't cleanse it on our own. The best picture of this type of cleansing, why it's needed, is found over in the words of our Lord in Matthew 23, beginning at verse 25. Jesus talking to the Pharisees, and He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. O oh, thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but within, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanliness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. They needed cleansing on the inside. Oh, they look good outside. Not a pretty picture, but one at one time, that's how we all appeared. We may have looked one way, 
but we lived another. Hypocrites fill the world. You know what hypocrite comes from? It's an idea of a, a stage actor in those days. He wore a mask. He played two roles. He put this mask on for one role, this mask on for another hypocrite. And that's what, a lot of times that's what the Christians do. We put on a Christian mask on Sunday and we put on the mask of the world the rest of the week hypocrites. They pretended, these Pharisees, they pretend to be so holy and righteous but the true person is within. You can cleanse the outside as much as you desire, but without Christ, your inside stays filthy, dirty, and there's no way to cleanse it. You can be so wonderfully looking on to others, and you are as far from the Lord as you can possibly be. You need to be cleansed within. Because you know why? Because what's in here comes out right here. If you're full of all that sin and iniquity and you don't have Jesus Christ, what comes out here is worldly. It's not what goes in, but what comes out that makes a person unclean. And you can only be cleansed by the power of Jesus Christ and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And then the term sanctified and justified, Paul uses them almost as synonyms. The first means to be spiritually set aside by the act of God, to be His people, to serve His purpose, set aside for the purpose of God, sanctified. Hagios is the Greek. The second is one of Paul's favorite words for what God does to make people His children. We are justified in Christ. Sometimes just remembering what Christ has done in our lives both, both motivates us and puts things in a larger perspective. It helps us understand what He has done. When we look at that, where would we be without it? Without Jesus Christ, without that salvation, where would we be? You'd have one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel. That's where you would be. One step away. I recall the a deacon's meeting years ago. Business and discussion went on for a long time and it was drawn out and people were very tired. Everybody wanted to go home. They were anxious for the meeting to be over, waiting for somebody to make a motion in seconds so they could go home. But when the business meeting, the business was finally finished, the head of the deacons, the chairman there said, I asked the three <clears throat> new deacons to give us their testimony. You can almost hear the bubble go. You could feel that resentment. But when those three new deacons shared their unique pilgrimage with God, and the people started listening, and the excitement in their voice, they realized, wow, there, there's something wonderful. The room just kind of lifted up. They realized these people were sanctified and justified and their witness served as a catalyst for the rest of those people to remember how God had dealt with them personally. When they heard the witness of these three and what God had done in their life, they started thinking about what God had done in their life and all of a sudden they weren't so tired. They weren't so concerned about going home. They were more concerned about what God had done in their life. We need to think about those things that God has done for us and get excited once again. And when that meeting was finally dismissed, there was a wonderful sense of joy and unity. And rather than going home, they just stood around and talked and visited. Kind of like that this morning service. Everybody just kind of gathered around out there and talked and visited for a while. But they talked and visited because they were remembering what God had done in their lives. The question you need to ask yourself this evening is this. Like the old hymn that we sing so often, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Because if you're not, you're not cleansed. The only thing that will wash you clean is the blood of the Lamb. You need to come to the fountain so rich and full. Our Lord Jesus Christ. May we pray. Father, I thank You for this very important message here. And I know that many times we 
do air our dirty laundry in public when we should be biblical and handle things one Christian to another. Put that on our heart, Father, to keep the things that we need to do biblical because your instructions are perfect. And I also ask, Lord, that we would continue to think back on all the wonderful things that you've done for us in our life. To think about our salvation. To think about that day. To think about the miracles. And just cause us to have so much joy and so much peace. I'm asking tonight, Father, that our folks deal with you according to whatever the need is in their life. If it's for salvation, I pray that they would come. Rededication, step out and come. Whatever it is, Father, I just pray that you would have their, your way in their life. We thank you for being a great and mighty God. We thank you for being a God who loves us so much that you sent your Son to die for us and that we can be washed clean by that precious blood. Thank you for all you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. And I pray that your word would lead this sanctuary tonight in the hearts of all of our people. And I pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.